So Bill, we've talked about getting the physical location and we've talked about when to plunge into private practice. Now it's about setting up your business entity and that legal side of things. Yeah, this is the not fun part of setting up a business, unfortunately. That's correct. Lots of paperwork, lots of numbers, lots of things to, uh, to decide upon. Beginning with, what's the form of business you're going to take? Right. Because there's a good reason not to just be out there as Bill Whitehead with my social security number, even though that's legally possible. Why should you not do that? Because it's not going to protect your personal assets if you do that. So if you set up into a corporation such as a limited liability corporation, an LLC, PLLC, there's other corporation types. If somebody slips and falls in your office, they're going to sue the corporation. I don't know about you, but my corporation doesn't have that many assets in it. But they can't take my personal car and my home away from me right. if they sue me. That's why it's called limited liability, because you're limiting it to the liability of the company. So they can, can and will take all of the assets of the company, take your copy or take right. your, any uh, money you have in your corporate uh, account. But they cannot take your home, they can't take your car, they can't take your retirement fund, which they would do if the slip right. and fall was under just Bill Whitehead. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, there's a dizzying array of other uh, forms of business. You could be, uh, as we said, a sole proprietor. You can be a uh, uh, partnership. You can be a limited liability partnership. You can be an LLC. You can be a PLLC. Mm -hmm. You can be a subchapter S corporation. You can be a C corporation. That was a lot of alphabet soup. It was. The thing to remember out of all of that is why don't you go with an LLC? <laughs> That's what LLC and PLLC are what most professionals end up uh, settling with. It, it seems to meet our needs the best. It does. And if you have any questions about that, in your, your there's local small business administration offices around almost all over the country and in most larger communities. Consult with them. It's free. It is a free service and they can give you a lot of advice on that type of entity to set up. And if you've already got a lawyer or already got a tax professional that you're working with, they can probably give you some good information Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Absolutely. So along with setting up an entity comes some numbers. So we talked about the alphabet. Now let's talk about numbers. Okay. Okay. And one of those numbers that you need is what's called an EIN, an employer identification number. Well, I'm not going to employ anybody, Bill. It's just me. I know. Isn't that strange that they would call it that when it has nothing to do with being an employer? If it's just you, you still need an EIN, Employer's Identification Number. It's just a, it's just a term. Yeah. And I happen to know that you can get one free. All you have to do is go to the IRS website. So you don't have to pay any money to get it. Just want everyone to know that it's yeah, free. 15 it's free minutes thing. and you've got one. And the nice thing about that, if you file insurance, if you put your social security number on that form, guess what? Your identity is going to be sold in, in no time flat. But with an employer identification number, you're putting that in the place where your social would go and you're protected from that. Right. Absolutely. So there's another number that's called the NPI or National Provider Identifier. Right. And you need that to be able to file insurance. Without an NPI, insurance companies will not pay you. Now, if you've been working under a group practice, you likely already have an NPI. Mm -hmm. And that just follows you. Right. So that's your number. Right. That's called the Type 1 NPI. Mm -hmm. And that will be yours for life. Ten, uh, ten digits long, but you can also get a type 2 NPI. What's that? So type 2 NPI is a number that is uh, represents your business entity. So that's going to be attached to the name of your business and probably to that tax ID number that you set up for that business as well. Now it's really neat because a type 2 NPI number getting that and when you credential with insurance companies, it means if you ever do want to grow into a larger practice than solo, it makes it very simple to do so. Much easier than if you 
got the uh, credentials with the insurance company just under your own NPI or your own social. Correct. That uh, makes it much easier going down the road. Correct. Um, you know, yet another number to add to the confusion is a taxonomy code, which probably doesn't mean that you're a taxidermist, right? Does it have anything to do with taxes? <laughs> no, it's a peculiar term. Yes, it is. Tell me what it means. A taxonomy uh, means who are you? What, it's identifying you as a professional. What kind of professional are you? So a social worker will have a taxonomy code. A psychologist will have a taxonomy code. A licensed professional counselor will have another taxonomy code. Uh, by the way, it can be confusing because you could be in more than one category and yet you can only have one code. The important thing to remember is it's not a big deal. Just choose one. For example, for psychologists, there's like four different codes that all say that you're a psychologist. Just pick one. There's some other paperwork that uh, it's helpful to have, it's not required, but you want to have some brochures, you want to have some business cards. You know, and that sounds funny in this electronic age that you would still need a brochure. What's the point of a brochure? Well, a brochure uh, is going to be a good advertising for you and, and people pick it up. Even if their clients come into your office the first time, they'll pick it up. They might give it to someone else. It's a, people don't tend to throw those away too much. They tend to leave them sitting around. Right. right. And if you ever give a public presentation, that's a place to have a stack of those brochures. It is. Something for them to take. And in the waiting room, as you yeah. say, to give to their friends. Make it nice. It's worth paying a professional a little bit of money to make those look nice and give your business an identity. You know, even though it may seem antiquated in these electronic days, I always gave out a business card that had the next appointment time written on the back of it. And the reason for that was I want my business card to go around. I want copies of my business card everywhere all the time. And that was a way of getting a lot of them out, uh, as well as being a nice reminder for people who may not be electronically sophisticated and Absolutely. don't have Google Calendar on their phone. Absolutely. There's a lot of nice designs out there, but I still think it's nice if you have the money to hire someone to kind of help you develop an identity for your business. There's another set of paperwork to talk about, and this is paperwork for your clients. So this is really about a legal process here, Bill, okay? That there are, there are certain things that your license and your ethics require you to disclose to patients about what their rights are and their responsibilities are in this relationship that you have, this professional relationship you have with a client. So you could produce just this dizzying array of documents for your clients to sign, but the good news is you can put them all into one document so that there's just one signature, but in there will probably need to go uh, consent to treatment, HIPAA disclosure that's required by the federal government that, the, that you have to tell them in some detail about uh, the privacy of their information. Right. You might want to put their fees in there. Absolutely. You might want to put in your no-show policy. You might want to put in uh, emergency contact information and what to do if there is an emergency. You might want to put in their duty to warn and limits to your own uh, uh, liability, uh, what to do in case of an emergency, right. a lot of information that's yeah. going to protect you as well as being legally required. Right. And if you take insurance and they're giving you permission to file their insurance claims, and uh, this can be a lengthy document, right? Yes, it can. There can be a lot in there. So um, you can look these, you can look up some sample ones of, you know, on the internet, you can do a Google search and do some sample ones, but I would really start with your ethics and license to know exactly what you need to have there as a minimum and go from there. And certain things like, um, with our practice management solution therapy appointment, those forms are already available. Right. So all you need to do is customize them to make them your own. I would probably still run them by a lawyer or somebody just to make sure I'm not missing out on anything. Because laws change and laws change differently in all 50 states. They do. And so it is a good thing. This is an important document and so uh, maybe worth a couple of hundred dollars to have your lawyer take yeah. a look at it. 
Absolutely. There's another important document that I have for patients, and most, most therapists will call it part of the intake process, but that is a, uh, a patient biography. Mm-hmm. And it's a set of questions I have that ask them about their symptoms, that ask them about um, relationships, living situations, illness, medications, past problems. And it's quite a lengthy document. And I used to have them come before session, like 20 minutes early to complete it, right? But now... Therapy appointment. Yeah. <laughs> now all of these things can be done and signed online uh, through practice management software like therapy appointment. Uh, so as they're setting up the appointment, uh, perhaps doing it online without you even being aware that they're doing it, they're automatically given access to these documents to sign and return to you electronically and fill out the biographical information form and return it to you electronically so that all of that just shows up in your software at your office without you having to lift a finger at all. It's a real convenience. That is real convenient. Of course, you still want some paper copies to give to patients who might not use technology or have access to that. Right. Those, it's becoming a rarer and rarer breed, but there still are those Luddites who just don't have a computer and, and uh, don't know how to do it. You know, a part of that document should be your fee structure. How do you know what to charge? Right, I have, I have seen um, with new therapists, uh, several of them undercharging for services. And, I, and Bill, I think this comes out of when you are in your supervised practice. Many of us are in situations where we're working with clients who are paying very little for therapy. Mm-hmm. And we don't necessarily value our services. I mean, if we've been getting paid twenty dollars for a session, we have to all of a sudden realize we're worth one hundred and twenty or one hundred and fifty or two hundred dollars, whatever it might be. Right. Typically, taking a look at not the nonprofit rates, but the private sector rates for what they're charging for a typical therapy session, stay right around in there. And hard information to come by, but some of your colleagues, especially in a local area society, will tell you what they're charging. And find kind of an average and then add five or ten dollars. The reason for that is that some people, well, you know it yourself. You go to the grocery store and you see the the five dollar bottle of shampoo and the twenty five dollar bottle of shampoo, and you automatically assume that the twenty five dollar bottle is better. Well, they think the same way. So if you're the cheapest one, instead of driving business to you, it may be driving business away from you. Absolutely. The other thing is if you're going to be on insurance panels, and we'll talk about this later, is you want to have your fees set high enough to capture the contracted rate that they're willing to pay you. Right, right. Because they are not going to chase you down the street to say, oh, you left some money on the table. Uh, Make Mm -hmm. sure you get this. Uh, Not at all. They will take the lower of their negotiated rate or what you have as your usual weight. Absolutely. Uh, You know, finally, there's another piece of document so common that you might not even think of it, which is your notes. And most professions require that you keep some kind of notes. Most insurance companies require that you keep some kind of notes in some kind of format about every session. Absolutely. So don't forget that. It is a legal requirement for your license if you are a licensed mental health professional. As well as being the requirement of the insurance company that a part of the fee that you have charged them is for the notes. And so there's a lot of different forms that you can take of that and you can fill up filing cabinets or you can do what? Well, where you keep your notes in an online practice management solution like therapy appointment. And um, I love it for two reasons. Um, I write my notes in there. It's a very simple process. But if I have a client call me at home in crisis, if they call in crisis, I can bring up their record right from home. Or if I'm on vacation, I can bring it up and I can look at it or I can have that conversation and document it right then as well. Back in the old days and when I started my practice, I had filing cabinet after filing cabinet after filing cabinet filled with patient charts, and now I have zero. Uh, It's just all kept in electronic form, backed up regularly. Uh, All HIPAA uh, requirements are met in the software. And the nice thing is, if you have a records request, it's just clicking a button. That's right. 
So everything's there. And uh, let's uh, put on the screen a, a way to get a hold of that so that you can find out for yourself. You know, we mentioned insurance, mm -hmm. and insurance is um, a very complicated topic that we'll get into next time. Uh, important to know at this point that therapy appointment also takes care of filing all your claims for you, a process that's incredibly daunting if you don't have uh, a thing like that. But we'll talk more about insurance next time. Absolutely. All right.